Welcome to Amiga Ireland. I'm Irla. I'm Rob. And I'm Luke. How have you been, guys? How are you enjoying this new weather we've got? Uh, it's fine. <laughs> um, it's pretty all right here in, here in England. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, of course, being Irish, we'll have to complain about it. And the Scots do it as well. You know, it's like, <laughs> as soon as the sun comes out, it's, oh my God, it's too hot. And we're <laughs> burning up in work and everyone's flopping around the place like, like they're half dead. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's lovely. <laughs> I have to put my hand up. I'm definitely one of those people. I've been craving the warmth to finally come. And now that it's here in excess, um, <laughs> That's I'm completely it. knocked out. Only a few weeks ago, I was bringing a hot water bottle to bed. And now I'm literally bringing an ice pack with me to push either <laughs> on my chest or under my neck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's mad. I can't <laughs> complain. I'm just used to, you know, it could be even hotter for me, to be honest, you know, like, uh, 35, 30, 35. It's, it's, it's pretty all right for me. It's, just, it's the same <laughs> thing if it comes to cold. I'm used to a different, th- different type of weather. More extremes, yeah. Yeah. I like when it is very, very cold during the winter. I just, you know, like long for that and wait for the snow and, and, and the mm. cold. And I, I just, I just have to have hot summers. It's just, uh, it's just, it's just the weather that, that, that we have in Poland. Therefore, I'm just like suffering from that, you know, like middle <laughs> weather. It's just not, not cold enough and not hot enough for yeah. me. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Absolutely. Like a tease for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, when I, when I, when I, when I, when I hear people here, like say like, um, oh no, it's so hot. I, I can't bury that. It's barely 23. I say like, it's hot. <laughs> like really? Seriously? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, but it's yeah. just a matter of being, you know, like brought up in a in a, in a different environment and in a just an, in a different country. So yeah, that's the thing. Um, if it comes to a hardware si- uh, side and the computers, I've been testing a new quality, high quality PSU4 C64. My f- a friend of mine, Ruff, has been building mm-hmm. them up, and uh, he's sent a couple of them. Uh, to me, and I must say they are pretty sturdy, and uh, the 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 build quality is pretty nice and pretty all right, and they are they are much better than the original uh, Commodore ones. Good stuff, yeah. Because in in particular, the the older C sixty four and Vic twenty ones are famous for failing, yes, and taking the machine with them. Yes, that's there's, right. Especially the yeah. RAM chips. Yeah, yeah, it's particularly yeah. sensitive. But yeah, they yeah. fail. When when they fail, the 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 five volt supply goes up and it's you yeah. know around 10 12 oh, I, I, volts or whatever yeah. and that's it i can i can hear that you that you that you that you're familiar with the, with the <laughs> subject pretty pretty well yeah 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 i've i've you see, I haven't got a Commodore 64 myself but you know it's i, I have as seen as it happen to a lot of people and break their hearts as far as i remember you started with an atari yeah am i right i did yeah 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 yeah, yeah um and as far as i know it doesn't have the same fail failure mode of the no, power supplies no, but no, uh, you know no. i just didn't hear about it but yeah yeah it was just particular for that particular uh family of power supplies i think because mm-hmm. the amiga ones don't do that either Mm-hmm. yeah or don't don't normally what about you rob well i have to give a shout out to alistair simpson in uh in edinburgh over here and because he's uh a few months ago, he gave me a few machines to look at and to recap and restore. And uh, finally, after getting around to them now, and I spent a, <laughs> a fair few evenings and weekends at it now. It's, it's been a, uh, a, b- a busy few days, let's say, a busy couple of weeks. But uh, it's like I've got through it now. I think there were um, uh, in total five Amiga 500s for recaps and repairs and two 600s and a 1200. So... Um, yeah, the, the, wow. yeah, and um, the wife would be delighted to see the back of them as well. <laughs> Just sitting everywhere here. <laughs> but, uh, it's like you're coming home to a factory job, Rob. <laughs> ex- exactly, exactly. You know, it's it's. Uh, I'm surrounded by them here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's all all done now. I have a few few smaller mods to do, RAM mods and things like that on the 500s. But uh, yeah, getting there. Lovely. Well, um, uh, while we're on the subject of power, um, I, we've had a donation to the museum from Eddie Carroll of um, an Amiga CD32, among other things. And mm. uh, I've noticed that, that that power supply is um, basically a DOA. So, uh, but the connector, I thought, would be the same as an Amiga 1200 or, you know, an Amiga 600. But it's, it's not. Yeah. It, yeah. Th- I think the connector is identical, just like for uh, C64, you know? The connector is identical, but the the 
inputs are different. So yeah, the inputs are different. Are yeah, that's I right. Even, I don't actually think it's identical. I think it's just similar, you know. Um, mm. But it's a standard DIN connector, so it's not like the twelve hundred and six hundred that's hard to find. You, that's that's an you can go into any electronic supplier and get that connector, so it's mm-hmm. safe enough. Ah, and it's well, just that's great. and it doesn't need minus twelve volts either. The the CD thirty two generates that internally, so it just needs five volts and twelve volts, and that's you can get an off the shelf modular power supply that'll do those two and uh, stick a DIN plug on it and away you go. That's great news. I've, I've, I have a feeling I'm going to be hearing more about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you, how do you, uh, how do you repair a fried CD32 oh, or mix up the inputs? I'll just sort out the power supply for you, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But, um, um, I did check on the uh, Amiga Twitter account there at one stage and Phil had tweeted out this um, nest cam. So he's got this bird's nest out in his backyard in a wooden box that these blue tits have nested in and he's hooked up a raspberry pi and an infrared camera and um so i've just left that on on a screen kind of in the corner it's kind of the closest i get to tv and <laughs> it's been amazing watching it you think it might be boring or something but there's so much going on mm. the more attention you pay so phil um i might cancel my netflix and send you the, the money <laughs> instead <laughs> yeah. very good cool we move on to the news yeah, yeah. Go on. So the LHA self-extracting archive has an update to version 2.1.5 and um, it's a really exciting update. They have removed some forgotten debug output. <laughs> so so be sure and update. Yeah, I, th- I think LHA, that's pretty legendary. much... Legendary. It is legendary, legendary, but it pretty much qualifies for mature at this stage. <laughs> it's very little yeah. that's going to change on it at this stage. But, yeah, uh, yeah it's good, good to see it's still getting a bit of attention though. Mm-hmm. And also Milky Tracker on Morphos has had a release, has some minor issues in the release notes, uh, but lots of features in it as well. So full screen and 16 bit screen modes are broken at the moment, but um, it's got some great things to offer like resampler options, including emulated Amiga 500 and 1200 sound output and MIDI in support, which is very interesting. Mm. I think it's the best tracker if it comes to NG systems, actually, you know? And it's yeah. and it's um and it's, and it's been developed for quite some time and and uh, um it's been available on I think nearly all platforms mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, I haven't actually used it myself, but uh, it, it does get a lot of uh, positive. Attention. I get a lot of positive stuff about uh, it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been using it uh, on Ami Party, you know, for for you know, like for playing some modules during the compo as well, ah. and it's it, it, on on a Mac Mini, for example, and it, it does the job really well. So I yeah. can recommend it fully. Good stuff. Yeah. I'm sure people uh, heard about the uh, replacement Amiga 1200 cases that were that that were kickstarted there a while ago. And um, I actually have one of them here for Alistair. And it's, uh, you know, they're they're uh, they're a very nice case, actually. Um, but uh, the same people have um, just just finished the the funding for a replacement Amiga 500 case. So it's a reproduction of the original Amiga 500 case with some modifications to take sort of modern peripherals, like, you know, sort of extra mounting points for things like uh, Raspberry Pis and compact flash readers and stuff like that. So I don't know the exact specifications of this one because it's only just been funded, but... Um, it's it's great to see that that's made its made its goal there because you know there'll be a lot of people a lot of five hundreds with broken cases or very yellow cases uh, or just you know the plastics quite brittle at this age and uh, yeah so it's great great to see that that's made its goal now there was a stretch goal to also get new cases for tank mice but uh, that that wasn't reached but uh, the, but the team are looking at you know if it's if it will be possible to um you know to 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 uh, cater for that anyway and you know so it, it might still be a possibility we'd have to wait and see i love that idea the tank mice <laughs> great yeah yeah and you know because you know they're in the cases are in a variety of colors and you know you, you see a few people with the or the, the mock-ups of the uh, uh, you know the blue tank mouse with the orange buttons for example for the you know the old 1.3 colors mm-hmm. and uh you know it's it's, it's a, it's a nice, a nice touch it looks a bit funky well, Vampire Card registration ends in June, and this appears to be for GDPR reasons. So there's a, a thread about that on their forum. The new cards will automatically be whitelisted. Um, 
so they used to offer this registration service you could go to the website and register your device when you received it um and it offered benefits like notifications uh, and downloads of new cores and stuff like that um now there's a comment in there from um uh, one member of the vampire team which says closing registrations will definitely kill any future clone cards now i'm not sure what that means guys right your v um does that uh, make sense there's a bit of, bit of drama in the whole vampire thing you know it's the amiga world isn't you know there's always going to be drama but uh there the whole reason the registrations came about is because there were uh what the original team counted as clone cards uh floating around and so people were buying these clone vampires and then you know sort of having problems with them and going to the vampire team so what the vampire team did then was that they with one of the cores when you updated it your output would be black and white or be grayscale until you registered it and then the next core update would introduce color back into it when it has a sort of a white list of the serial numbers that are genuine Ah, so that's that's why it came about but a lot of people weren't very happy with that thing and i you know with that with that approach it seems a bit a bit bit heavy-handed or a bit you know i don't know i i'm not i I don't have good feeling about it anyway but gdpr seems to have uh put an end to it anyway so we'll, we'll see what happens but i think the situation was that uh, even if you had one of the clone cards that you could register it and then get it fully functional anyway, or sort of at your own risk, if you like. But um, I, I presume that will be finished. So so this will, if you do have a clone card, this will be the last chance to register it. Um, you know, and to get it working properly, I guess. If they're that does it. sound like a bit of a nightmare if they if they're getting people coming back to them for service and they didn't even make the card. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know whether they made the card or not is a bit of a grey area as well. But that's for that's a discussion oh. for another day. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, I get. I see where that's going. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, right. Morphos has received an update of RNO widgets. Um, these widgets are pretty, I must say, they are pretty stylish and pretty nice. They remind me of widgets from actually Windows Vista, but, mm-hmm. uh, in an amigish way, you know? And, um, just a couple of updates and a couple of bugs, but still, um, I'm really glad, uh, there's progress. The other thing mm-hmm. is, um, um, Michał Barański, which is a director, uh, of um documentary about a demo scene called The Art of Breaking uh, Ground has released um its documentary uh on YouTube and it, the documentary itself is in Polish but uh, uh YouTube provides subtitles um English subtitles as well and I encourage everyone to see this uh this this piece of documentary as it shows a bit of a Polish demo scene the, the history uh the, the the famous people and uh and uh, what's going on around in that part of uh, Europe regarding Amiga and 8-bit demo scene. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've seen a couple of posts about that in the last while. I must I must, must give it a look. Um, the K1208 cards, which are... Um, these are these are RAM cards for the Amiga 1200. Uh, so Kipper 2K is, has basically designed these, but they're based on the, the, the Stephen Leary's design for the... Um, the eight megabyte RAM cards for the CD32. So given that the two machines are quite similar, it's a sort of, a, you know, sort of an evolution of that, um, or an alternative take on that. But they're basically almost ready for, uh, for shipping. And that, that will, uh, you know, the, or for manufacture. And that will be a nice little card for someone who's looking for a basic, uh, you know, a WHD load machine, because it'll give the 1200 a little bit of a speed up, even though it's just RAM, you know, it's, it's, it's nice fast RAM and, um, it should be, uh, you know, it's a nice, nice little card. But it, I believe it also offers, is it an SD slot or a SATA connection? I can't remember now. Oh. But it, it also offers some sort of storage solution, you know, so that which is faster than the onboard IDA or, you know, sort of a little bit sort of more modern than the onboard IDA on the 1200. So it'll be an in- interesting little card for a nice WHD load machine. Yeah, nice touch there with the um, the storage yeah, yeah, interface, because yeah. that's, yeah, because, th- yeah, the, the terrible fire one that the, for the CD32 is similar, you know, with its, has a, a compact flash slot. And again, that's, that's great for a WHD load machine. So, yeah, both, both cards are great. But yeah, so that'll be, 
hopefully available in the next uh, next next while. Always some new hardware. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. Amiga Kit have completely revamped their website. You can visit amigakit.com and uh, it's completely responsive and works on mobile. So if you um, haven't been on the Amiga Kit in the last couple of days, you might actually miss this because it's very recent. Mm-hmm. So yeah, nice. Yeah. And this has just cropped up in the last couple of days, really, or it seems to be gathering a bit of momentum. But there's um, there's a, a, a game development competition that's that's taking shape on the EAB forums. And the, the idea being that uh, people will uh, will write a game and submit it to to be judged. And there is so far 455 euros in prize money after being donated to it, and still still rising. So um, yeah, so it's, if if you've been itching to to write a game or you have an idea for a game, now is the time to 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 do it. And uh, you know, and even if you're sort of if you're an artist who can't really code, then, you know, pair up with a coder who can't really draw and, you know, and, uh, and, and get a game out between you and, uh, so yeah, sure, you never know what might happen. But, um, so the, the format of the competition isn't finalized yet, but at the moment it's looking like three separate categories. There'll be a, a, a category for the 500, you know, basic 500 with one mega RAM, a category for AGA machines, like, like, 1200 CD32 and a category for whatever you want, which could include, you know, RTG, you know, much higher spec, you know, 060s or whatever, uh, you know, whatever you want, basically. So that, that's kind of how it's looking. But, uh, the, like I say, the, the results in the closing date aren't finalized or anything yet. But, uh, yeah, give, there'll be a link in the show notes, but give, give it a look if you're, uh, thinking of writing a game. Lovely. And on that note, let's move on to the gaming section. Mm. I don't know if you guys remember the Street Fighter 2 for C64. Um, I actually remember it pretty well. The backgrounds of that game were pretty pretty nice if it comes to, you know, like, uh, Commodore possibilities. But mm-hmm. the, 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 you know, the main characters of the game, they were just absolutely awful. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And actually, someone has been, you know, like, uh, trying to fix that. And there are some uh, screenshots, actually, in circulation about a new and revamped version of uh, Street Fighter 2 for C64. And I actually mm-hmm. look forward to it, as it was a pretty decent beat-em-up game, especially for Amiga, to be honest, you know? Hmm. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't know Street Fighter 2 was available on the C64 anyway, to begin I think with. It, I think it was even available for ZX Spectrum, to be honest, you know? Yeah, it was <laughs> one of those games that was ported to everything. And it's better than on C64. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, fair enough, yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's a really good article on Vintages and New Olds. They've, you know, they've pointed back to previous interviews and stuff with uh, the game creator and stuff. So fair play to the, the folks over there on a good article. Um, you can add auto fire to your favorite joystick now, even if it doesn't have it built in, thanks to a tutorial series from Miss Mad Lemon called Rapid Fire Project. We've got a link to it here, and um, Maddie does a really good job of showing you the circuit diagrams, as always, explaining the components you need. It looks really cool. It has um, a rotary dial on it to change the rate of the auto fire. Um, uh, it just it looks great. It works really nice. So yeah, fair play. Yeah, it does. It's a nice little project there for anyone who's, you know, if you're looking to delve into the world of soldering and that. It's, yeah. Um, now I always struggle with this. I don't know whether it's BOH or BOH, but anyway, it's a, there's this sort of top down sort of exploring puzzle strategy game that's been around for a few years now. And, um, uh, over the, it's, it, it got a good reception, uh, whew, maybe five, eight, I can't remember exactly when it came out, but, um, a good few years ago. And it's slowly and steadily been updated, uh, you know, and it's had a lot of updates and a lot of new levels, new content has been added to it over the years. And, uh, you know, it's, it does seem to be, have a sort of a bit of a following. But this is, this sort of ultimate edition of it is, is, uh, ready to be released now and, uh, the, you know, on, on physical media as well as, a, as a download. And that's, that's, that's great, you know, for 
you know, it's always nice to have a box on the shelf or, you know, to, to get a physical copy of a game. So that's great to see. Right, OpenXConf Morpheus has been released as well. I, um, uh, I, I don't know if you remember the game um, uh, UFO, Enemy Unknown. I'm pretty sure yeah. you've, you, you remember that. Some people claim it's uh, actually uh, one of the best games ever. And it's like um, a 3D strategy game, you know, like based on um, games like Laser Squad. And uh, Steph Koss, um, Morpho's developer, actually ported uh, OpenXCOM to Morpho's system, and it looks pretty, uh, pretty nice, I must say. And the playability is good too. <laughs> I can't believe. Okay, I can't, this game keeps coming up for the last <laughs> couple of days in front of my face. I was, uh, <clears throat> I was asking about what a good game would be for um the macbook i have that doesn't have a graphics a dedicated graphics card because they're the machines i buy so that i will work instead of playing games and um <laughs> and you're somebody looking for games said, for it <laughs> I, I am yeah i know i know <laughs> and uh somebody said you should try xcom i yeah. think it was they said x yeah so so then i thought hang on a second that sounds familiar so I, I went searching for it and yeah there's an old amiga game for it and i thought well geez what's the point in getting one on the uh, mac if i can you know just play it on the amiga so um, then uh, literally a couple of hours later, somebody posted in the Facebook um, group <laughs> for Amiga Ireland about um, uh, about the UFO, that game, mm-hmm. um, Enemy Unknown. And then there's a whole series of comments underneath where people are talking about like there was a previous version of the game or something beforehand. And so there's Daniel Saigonek, Seamus Doyle and uh, Andrew are, are chatting away the details. So, um, yeah, I can't escape this game at the moment. <laughs> it's been stalking you then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's talking me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm surprised you managed to avoid it, to be honest, uh, because it was it, it is pretty. It's a pretty big game, you know. It's not a. It is a pretty it's, big it's game. Kind of yeah. Mainstream as the Mega games go, but uh, it is very good. It's very good. Yeah, yeah. I remember it from the magazines, you know, from seeing it on, in the advertising and stuff um, back mm. in the day, but never actually ended up with it in my possession for some reason. Oh, there's, yeah, there's try there's it. Some homework for you. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> um, beta testers are needed for Speedball 2 Ultimate for Commodore 64. How brilliant is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. They're looking for, quote, seasoned veterans. Now, I immediately thought of Darren from Bambi Amiga, who, <laughs> um, possibly still has a C64 and he's been interested in Speedball 2 at the event. So he might be the right guy to get involved there. But, um, yeah, that's really cool that they're working on a nice, uh, modernized version. Mm. In inverted commas. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, now, um, this one kind of came out of the blue, and it's 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 great. So uh, we're all familiar with Worms and how it started on the Amiga and the legend that is the you know the programming competition and all that kind of crack that it surrounds that. But um, at, w- w- after Worms became a huge phenomenon, um, the creator Andy Davidson and uh, Team Seventeen released. Uh, Worms, the director's cut, which was the sort of the final version of it for the Amiga and it was sort of a, a farewell to the Amiga, if you like. And, uh, it was, you know, it, it was AGA only. So it was, you know, they upped the colors. They added music to the title. They added so many more features and basically it became, you know, almost like an entirely new version of Worms with, you know, that just looked a bit like the old version. And it was, it's, it's really, and for me and for a lot of other people, it's the best version of the game that there is. Um, now, and it was, is, it was also an Amiga exclusive. Now, it sold terribly. So, uh, it was right at the end of the Amiga 1996 or whatever. It was kind of, everything was going away and it only sold a few thousand copies. And it was for such a good game. It's, you know, it's a travesty, but, uh, that's, that's how it goes. But it turns out that there was a, an update were planned for it to add some extra features that just didn't make the cut at the time because it, it didn't fit on the number of floppies that were needed. And they were going to release a sort of a, an add on disc to fix some bugs and to you know add some new levels add some new features you know like like background sounds and music and stuff like that for during the levels and that's um you know these are things that were in the pc version and worms 2 and that so um there just the other day andy davidson himself has announced on the commodore amiga facebook group that he is working on this update so he's after digging out his 1200 he's dug up his old code and he's relearning what he did and how to program and <laughs> or how to how to work in this particular code in blitz and uh, so he's hoping to release 
this update uh, 20, year, 20 years later, <laughs> which is which is brilliant, you know, and, and he is hoping to be able to release the entire game uh, free. So it'll be full, a full version of Worms Director's Cut with all the updates and hopefully be able to be available as a free download at some point soon. So um, there's no timeline on it or anything like that. It's his own, you know, little thing, but, you know, it shows you can never escape the Amiga. <laughs> When I came across Worms, it was on the PC, like after Amiga was kind of gone, that I saw friends playing it and stuff. So um, I didn't realize it had origins or was even, you know, possible on the Amiga. Yeah, it's uh, it, it was that. But that was that was the thing. It was a, an entry to a it was an Amiga format programming competition. One of the magazines anyway. And the, the top prize for this competition was a, a publishing contract with one of the games producers. And um, it didn't even win. So, so, um, so Andy Davidson, uh, just basically went to some expo or something like that and approached Team 17 with a disc and said, here, you know, you're going to like this. And I, as far as I know, that is how it went. Um, you know, so, uh, <laughs> kind of like, I, it's, it's sort of the stuff of legend at this stage, but, uh, that's it. And, uh, from what I remember, the disc that he kind of produced needed very little, changing before it was actually released you know it was practically finished which is uh which is amazing you know as one guy created this entire world you know this entire thing yeah he got the recipe just right yeah exactly the graphics the voices like it's not an entirely original concept but the just the the balance of everything the the particular weapons the yeah the physics of it the yeah the, the look of it the sound of it everything was just right yeah spot on it seems that uh, C64 is going to get another port, um, but uh, this time it's going to be um, Eye of the Beholder. Do you remember this one from Amiga? I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very good dungeon cl- uh, crawling game, and uh, uh, it's pretty huge, I must say. But the yeah. graphics, um, on, but the graphics, because there are already screenshots uh, of, of of that project and the progress, the graphics on the C64 is just magnificent and beautiful. I really like it. If you're a fan of uh, of of dungeon games, uh, you and, and you're a fan of C64, then you have to see it and you have to play it. You know, it was great on the Ami- on the Amiga. I really look forward to the C64 version. And Barbarian Plus Enhanced for Amiga has been teased and it looks really good. Um, there are animations and screenshots and stuff that you can check out. And Indie Retro News has the scoop on that. And that means it's time for Discoveries. Rasport is an interesting company. Um, it designs and manufactures devices for um, Amiga. Amongst um, many devices, there are, for example, like channel mixing headphone amplifier, serial port MIDI interface, angle PCM CIA connector, single port ID adapter for SD to ID, and dual port ID converter and, ad- and adapter. So, if you're looking for for devices that might be a bit helpful for your Amiga. Why not have a look down there? Most people use at one point or another, so uh, yeah, very useful to see that they're still available. Yeah, this one is something that uh, you know, I've I come I've come across before ages ago, but uh, it's it's nice to know it's there. Um, the um, the reference manuals for the sixty eight thousand processor is still available. Uh, you know, obviously it was Motorola and then it was Freescale, and now it's NXP. NXP semiconductor, but, uh, yeah, they still have on their website the reference manuals for the CPU. And, uh, it's there with all the opcodes, all the, 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 you know, the, the programming modes, the, you know, all the addressing modes, everything that you need to be able to write, uh, raw 68K assembly is, is all there. And it's, it's a, it's a very good reference manual that I'm sure I have stored on my hard drive somewhere from years ago. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's nice to know it's still there and still in a way supported. Um, yeah, but it's even even if you just a vague interest in it, you know, from looking at Amiga source code, for example, and or you know, looking at hardware drivers or whatever, it's 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 a nice reference to have there. And um, I'd said already that the power supply in the CG32 has a different connector than the Amiga 1200, so that is my discovery. Um, so, but um, Rob, I might ask you another question then. Hmm. Um, so. 
is the best way to test these power supplies before we go hooking them up to, you know, plug them in and check the voltage or do they ideally need to run around a board to be measured? Because I've seen both methods described online. Yeah. And, uh, and both methods are, you know, are right some of the time. That's, that's it. So really to be safe, you should have some sort of dummy load, like a couple of hard drives or something like that sitting there to run, you know, because, uh, depending on how the power supply is designed, might need a minimum load to be able to stabilize the voltages. So it, it sort of, it oh, needs, interesting. The, basically the output of a power supply needs a little bit of feedback if it sort of automatically adjusts itself. And that's how a lot of them work. Uh, the particular type they call switch mode power supplies, they work by getting feedback from the output. And then they const- they adjust millions of times a second to keep the voltage at the same level. So if they, if there's no load, they don't really get any feedback. And this causes the voltage to drift a bit. And so you might not get a proper measurement. Um, so usually just connecting a fan or a hard drive or something, you know, an old hard drive you have lying around the place is enough of a load to get it to stabilize. And so that, but that's, that's it. Now, but there are other types of power supply that don't need that. Sometimes they have an internal little load if they're designed to not constantly be connected to a computer. But, but because these things are generally designed to be connected to only be used with a computer, they, tend to sort of ignore the dummy load themselves because, you know, they're saving costs. But, um, okay. yeah, but if, if it's not a switched in power supply, it's usually sort of fairly stable when to switch on and, and measure the voltage straight off without any load. But just to be safe, if you have a socket around to, to, that you can sort of, you know, cobble something together with a hard drive, that's probably the safest bet. Okay, thanks for that, Rob. Okay, and it's time for community news and events. Decrunch 2048 is happening on the 29th of June. It's a three-day demo party with lots of Amiga Amiga demos, music, 2D graphics, 3D renderings, and you can visit decrunch.org to find out more about this. And uh, Luke, I see Helm Amiga Legion are involved in this. Yeah, some of our guys, have, uh, they've, they've, they've been helping um, with Decrunch as well. Uh, the thing is, actually... Um, June and July, August and September is very, very popular if it comes to uh, parties and, you know, like um, Amiga parties or in general retro computing parties in Poland. So um, we'll be mentioning Amiga Visco as well, the 16th and 17th of June. But there's also Amiga Eastern meeting on the 7th of, uh, of July. There's also Pixel Heaven. Uh, I think it's, it's either tomorrow or on the 8th. Uh, that's starting, and there's you know there's Ami Party in uh, the in 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 August. There's uh, um, uh, uh, Ami BP. Uh, this is an- another one which which takes place in September. There's uh, Ami Party in um, in uh, August. So. Uh, Trust me, sometimes there are like two or three events in Poland um, <laughs> during one month. So in general, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's huge down there, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Mm, sounds like a busy summer. Very busy, to be honest, <laughs> you know. <laughs> sounds like heaven. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, uh, and this is uh, a provisional notification, I suppose, but... Uh, we're looking at having another meeting in Glasgow on the 4th of August. Is this for Scottish Amiga users? Um, so the venue is not tied down just yet. So, uh, the date is only provisional, but Saturday the 4th of August is what we're looking at. And, uh, so, you know, we had a, a meeting in February. So, you know, it was a nice, nice meeting and, uh, hopefully more of the same this, this time around. Um, we actually have a, a gaming competition in uh cooperation with the Amiga North Thames guys, I think. Uh that we've 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 agreed to sort of you know compare our high scores at the at the meeting and so that 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 should be fun. And um I think there's a request for some soldering workshop as well. So um so that yeah so it look, looks like it uh yeah it'd be in, interesting if you happen to be in Glasgow the first weekend in August. Nice, best of luck. Thanks very much. Right, it's time for Ask Amiga feel like I've already had my Ask Amiga thing with the <laughs> power supplies. But um, a post I saw a little while ago on the Retro Stack Exchange uh, website, and someone was asking, well, basically about how two-button joysticks work. Because if you if you look at the 
standard, you know, the 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 nine pin connector that uh, you know a lot of the well, basically nearly all the eight bit computers had, and the ST and the Amiga and even the Master System Mega Drive. A lot of computers use this this eight, nine pin D socket for their controllers, and they pretty much all follow the, the Atari standard, which is sort of up, down, left, right, and fire and two paddles, which is, and then five volts and ground. So that that's all your pins used up. So with the Amiga supporting two button joysticks, uh, you know, how does that work when, you know, you've only got one fire button input on the, on the port? Well, basically it's because the Amiga hardware is pretty versatile and the two analog inputs, which are usually used for paddles, are, um, they're connected to Paula. And you, as you know, Paula does the sound on the Amiga and that's, you know, an analog digital chip. And, or sorry, it, yeah, but it does both. It does digital analog for the audio and analog digital for the inputs. And so that has a very sort of rough analog input element to it, but it all, it can also configure the, the pins whatever way it likes. So it can configure them as analog or as digital or as an input or an output. So that lets it, you know, so basically, so what, what happens is if you want to read the button of the joystick, you, uh, you just, you just read it. You just basically configure the pin as, as digital, as an input, and as uh, as a high voltage, and then you can read you can read that then and see whenever it gets pulled down to zero, which is low, and that 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 will tell you that the button has been second button has been pressed. So it works the same way as the uh, the original fire button. It's just a matter of configuring the chip to understand that input, and that that can be done with the. Um, with the second part input as well, which gives an, which actually gives you access to three buttons, although very few things use three buttons other than reading a three button mouse. But yeah, that's, that's, that's it. It's, it's quite a versatile input and output port. And, uh, yeah, it's quite, quite useful for two buttons, three buttons. And because it can be configured as outputs, it can also be used for multiple button pads like the Mega Drive pad, which, you know, with, with a bit of funking around can, can read all the, all four buttons. And the CD32 pad, which use both of which use one pin as an output to control which buttons to read, at a, you know, at a, at a simple level. So there you go. There are actually quite a few games that use analog joysticks on the Amiga, and they yeah they use those inputs just fine. Well, we've got a new section potentially. We'll try it out and see how it goes. This is online activity in our groups, so. Um, we've got two main places online, well, three main places. We have a Facebook group, we've got a Twitter account and an IRC channel. This month on the Facebook group, there's been a post called Pick One by Seamus Doyle, um, which is a conversation about which do you prefer, worms or lemmings? And, uh, and I think actually a, a more people went for lemmings than worms, which surprised me, even though lemmings is my favorite because uh, most people that I know prefer worms, but there you go. Mm. It's not too late to go and tip the balance there if you want to go and visit our Facebook group. And on Twitter, uh, our top tweet was a screenshot from the movie Mute, uh, which was released this year. And there's a reference to Syndicate on Amiga, and I couldn't believe it when I was watching it. Um, so there's a character, and there's these guys. These one of the you know the bad guys, and there's uh, these characters sitting in the corner behind them, and they've got the the masks covering the lower half of their faces, and their eyes are completely whited out, and they've shaved heads. And uh, I thought, God, they look just like the guys off the cover of the Syndicate box. And mm. uh, the the guy says, "See that Syndicate over there? They work with my boss." So um, mm. I thought that can't be a coincidence. So it turns out um, the creator of the movie was actually an Amiga fan. There you go. And a, and a great game it is too. Cyberpunk, yeah. I've yet to finish the first level actually of Syndicate. I just never got much time with it. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It, You've it got is, a lot of a, homework to be done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a fantastic game and, um, it's, uh, yeah, the, the levels get, some of them get very involved and very clever later on. Um, you know, you guys, you know, because you can tool them up and you get more wide and varied weapons and, and things like that. It's, it, it, it's, it's very well done. And, uh, and then when you've completed it all, there's the, there's a mission disc that you can get for it as well. So that was, uh, rare enough because it was a mail order only thing, but, uh, I have it here somewhere and it's, uh, ridiculously difficult, but it is really, really good as well. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Another one for the list. Yeah. <laughs> Right, well, um, in our next episode, 
We will interview with Tower 57 developer Marco, a.k.a. Benito Sub. Talking about his Amiga inspirations. And what motivated him to make the Amiga ports. So that's, you know, for OS 4, Eros and Morph OS, you know, were released there earlier this year. Cool. So looking forward to that. It's goodbye from us. Thanks everyone for listening. Music was by Virtual Dimensions and Banjo Gaiali. And we're going to play out with episode one by Ezu, uh, which is four channel Pro Tracker module, which came first in the Amiga demo compo at GURP 2015. So that's bye from us. Bye bye. Bye bye. Nope. I'm waiting for music. <laughs> no music?